Prior to continuing, we need to do one more thing. To be able to create instances inside our plane class, we need to access previously mentioned global interface. Because only our descriptor has it, we need to pass the global interface from it inside the plane class's constructor and store it in a member variable. The global descriptor also needs to pass this global variable to our plane class. It is time to implement the build mesh method. Simple object base class has a field called mesh, which contains the class that we need to generate. First, we will acquire this object so that we can work on it directly. To create a rectangular plane, we will use two triangles side by side, since a triangle is the basic primitive used in meshes. First, we will create four points that represent the four corners of our plane rectangle. This is done by resizing the vertex array inside the mesh class and then setting each vertices coordinates one by one. All point coordinates inside the mesh are referred to as its geometry. Because we alter these coordinates, we need to tell the mesh that we have done so by calling the invalidate geom cache method. Next, we will link the four vertices together by two triangles. First triangle is connecting vertices 1, 2, and 3, and second one, 1, 3, and 4. We will do this by resizing the faces array to 2 and then setting the vertex index of each triangle one by one. To make sure that only edges outside of a rectangle are visible and the edges inside of it are invisible, we will also uh, set the edge visibility flags for our two faces. Information about how vertices inside the mesh are linked together is called topology. We now notify our mesh that its topology has changed by calling invalidate topology cache. We are now done with our mesh generation. To let our parent class know this, we set the iValid property to infinite, thus telling it that we never want to regenerate this mesh again unless its length or width changes. Now we will handle the plane creation mechanism inside the viewport. To do this, we will need to derive from a class called createMouseCallback and pass the derived class as an instance from plane's createMouseCallback method. First, we create a class and derive it from createMouseCallback. Because this class will deal with our plane, we will take its instance inside the constructor and store it in a member variable. Now we will override the PROC method. This is the method that determines how an object is created inside Max's viewport. It is very similar to any other mouse handling procedure and will get code whenever user presses, releases or moves the mouse. Point argument is provided to specify how many times user has clicked the mouse inside the viewport. On first press, point is set to 0. On first release, it is set to 1. Any subsequent mouse clicks will each result in point being incremented by 1. Using this knowledge, I am going to write in a simple algorithm which records the first mouse click coordinate and then assigns the length and width values for a plane based on how far the mouse cursor is moved away from that point. To learn more details on this implementation, you can look in the code provided in the source files for this tutorial or check out Sphere object sample files that come with 3D Studio Max SDK. Once we have finished writing this method, we need to return an instance or a creation callback from inside the plane class. We can now rebuild and test the project again. After the rebuild is complete, 3D Studio Max will automatically reload the plugin. 
When we go back to Max.net tutorial rollout, we can now attempt to create our plane object. And, just like we programmed it, it appears inside the viewport. If you try to use this plugin now, two things will become apparent when saving a scene. First, you will get an unknown class exception and a file save error. This is caused by the fact that our plane class doesn't override the class ID property, which we will fix in a moment. Second, even if we do fix the class ID issue when uh, you reload the scene, all planes will be the size of one unit. And uh, this is because we did not implement any mechanism for saving and loading the width and length parameters with the scene. Traditionally, 3D Studio Max has a special parameter block structure for persisting object properties. However, due to the limited scope of this tutorial, we will use a simpler method of saving our, our plane information into the scene's binary stream. First, let's go back and override the class ID property. Here, we can return the class ID static member variable we defined inside the class descriptor earlier. Now we will implement the two methods of our plane, load and save. These methods handle saving and loading any object information that we might have so that it is persisted with our scene file. 3D Studio Max passes the iLoad and iSave interfaces, which act as binary streams uh, to which we can read and write data. Before writing each block of data, we need to specify a ch chunk ID, which partitions our information into small blocks so that we, we, they can be loaded in any order later on. Once we have implemented saving and loading with our width and length parameters from the scene, we can rebuild it and test it again. Now if we save and load the scene, everything works as expected. Congratulations, you have just written a geometry plugin inside 3D Studio Max. For more information on source codes for this tutorial, please visit our website. If you have any comments or questions, please contact us or leave a message on our forums. Thank you for listening.